welcome back everyone. Our first speaker is Henry Hansman from the Yale Law School. Well, thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be here for my first visit to Ono University. And uh, my special pleasure to be uh, uh, under the, here under the uh, good care of my good friend and former student Zohar Goshen. Zohar Goshen, you all know, remains a legend at the Yale Law School um, as being the most, uh, 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 the fastest and the best JSD, Doctor of Juridical Science student we've ever had. So, um, uh, so thank you, Zohar. Uh, it's uh, good to be working for you. Um, the paper I'm going to present is actually has three authors. One of them is my colleague, Ron Gilson. You're going to hear from on another subject pretty shortly. And uh, the third author is Mariana Pargentler, who is uh, from Brazil. Now, I don't know if you all can see this board. Some of you may be uh, blocked off, but I'll try to repeat its contents in any case. We're going to move, of course, here. Uh, it's an academic you have uh, in front of you, and an academic from the Yale Law School. Um, which some people don't think really is a law school, um, but a philosophy department. But um, uh, as it is, we're going to change here from a, 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 a focus on doctrine and cases uh, to, a, to a, the big overview uh, of law and how it's generated. But Delaware, uh, as always, is going to continue to play a large role uh, in it. The, um, uh, we're going to look at corporate chartering in a, in a federal system. Uh, the United States is, of course, a federated republic. Uh, now so is the European Union. And uh, both have to struggle with the allocation of power of, of, of making and enforcing corporate law uh, among the many jurisdictions in a federal system here. There are essentially three uh, different uh, approaches to this, three polar approaches or ideal type approaches. The first is the real seat doctrine, which prevailed long in Europe, in which a company must incorporate in its uh, headquarters state, in its principal place of business. The second is free incorporation, uh, or what we call in the United States the internal affairs rule, under which a corporation uh, in the federal system can uh, incorporate at, at its will in any of the jurisdictions, any of the member states of the federation. And finally, there is federal chartering, chartering at the federal level, by the federal government, the national government, that is, um, uh, rather than at the member state level. The common assumption um, um, uh, among American scholars and I think among European scholars as well is that uh, free incorporation, which is the system uh, uh, that prevails in America, uh, promotes what is called regulatory competition. That is to say, states compete with each other uh, to attract companies to, in, to incorporate uh, in their jurisdiction. That competition may take either of two different forms. One is it's active competition in which states self-consciously redesign uh, continually their corporation law and their adjudication of that law to make it attractive to uh, corporations and hence attract chartering business there. The uh, other is that it might be passive competition in the sense that uh, the states aren't really uh, trying hard to attract firms to incorporate there. They generate their law comes to them from who knows where uh, for historical reasons or whatever. They've adopted their, their law. We don't know or we don't care much. What's happening is it's the firms themselves are generating the competition. They are picking and choosing among, in America, the, the law of the 49 other, the law of the 50 states um, to find which one they like the best. And they are the ones that are competing, uh, that are driving the competition, not the states themselves. Again, the general assumption in the literature is that uh, both, whatever the source, the, the type of competition, whether it's active competition or passive competition, it yields or it creates pressure toward um, legal homogeneity, homogeneity in corporation law across the jurisdictions. Um, that occurs in active competition uh, with, uh, with um, uh, the states all adopting similar corporation law. As they compete with each other, they're driven to uh, offer the same, uh, presumably efficient, system of law. Under passive competition, uh, it involves all firms picking the same state uh, because that state just happens to offer, by chance, the best corporation law and the corporations figure it out. 
Uh, when I say the best, I mean the most attractive corporate law, the one that the corp appeals most to the corporations or the controlling shareholders or managers who make those decisions on behalf of the corporation. The, uh, the debate then focuses on whether or not the, the corporation law, the body of corporation law that is the winner in this respect, that, that uh, is offered by the state that uh, attracts the most corporations, is good law or bad law for social welfare purposes and or even just for the corporation itself. Uh, they should go together. What's good for the corporation and its constituencies should be good for overall social welfare. Um, those who like the resulting body of law that wins under regulatory competition uh, like regulatory competition uh, and uh, they like the free incorporation system, the choice of law rule that uh, allows for free incorporation uh, in turn. Um, uh, others uh, who don't like the resulting system of, of corporation law uh, often find the real seat doctrine or federal chartering uh, under either of which the corporation has no choice about its corporation law to be more appealing. We, uh, uh, offering that too simple view of the current level of scholarship, um, we want to suggest that we, we see, the three of us that is, see a rather different dynamic uh, playing in addition to or in place of the conventional regulatory competition view of interpretation of federalist chartering, federalism chartering. We've termed this dynamic uh, uh, regulatory dualism in contrast with regulatory competition. And in the regulatory dualism interpretation, free, freedom of incorporation, uh, as in the United States, uh, it drives corporate law among the different states not toward, not toward homogeneity, not toward similarity, but toward diversity, heterogeneity. Uh, to see this, uh, we view firms as essentially of two types, or better yet, following two different strategies toward, uh, uh, toward uh, their relationship to their chartering jurisdiction. There are firms that seek what we call market-oriented law, and that is law that uh, uh, facilitates efficient transactions in the, in the stock market that is uh, sensitive to shareholder value, uh, that is uh, uh, responsive to, uh, to stock market prices uh, that reflect shareholder value, and uh, they're open to a market for a corporate control that's in influenced by the stock markets. They impose strong fiduciary duties on controlling shareholders and on uh, 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 managers to, um, to protect the, uh, the value of the corporation to shareholders. And to make it easy, in particular, for shareholders or for companies to issue uh, stock uh, at a high price because the people who buy the stock know that even if they aren't in control of the corporation, uh, they will be treated fairly. Then there are companies that seek what we call politics-oriented law. These are companies that are looking for a jurisdiction where they can have some influence over the making of corporate law and uh, uh, so that they can make it to their favor uh, or have it adjudicated to their favor um, or where they can have, have influence over other bodies of law, uh, where they can get building permits or whether they can get uh, uh, labor disputes settled properly or contractual suits with their, their customers or tort litigation or whatever. But they're looking for a jurisdiction where they have some influence over the legal system, some political influence. Applied to the United States, in a simple-minded version at least, um, uh, Delaware is the firm that provides market-oriented law. And in fact, as it is, most uh, um, exchange-listed firms in the United States incorporate in Delaware. The, um, the other 49 states, with a possible exception of Nevada, which we can come to if there's a moment uh, uh, at the end, which I doubt there will be, um, um, uh, aren't actively competing for charters. Um, rather, they're chosen by uh, local firms, uh, locally headquartered firms, that wish to maintain influence uh, over the local state politics. And uh, again, this could be the design of corporate law or the um, uh, application of, of other aspects of law. This view of things tends to provide for complementarity uh, between, the, rather than, rather than uh, uh, as it, well, it, 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 rather than homogeneity, homogeneity among 
uh, bodies of corporate law. Their um, uh, Delaware, uh, as it is, has the advantage um, that virtually no corporate constituencies are resident in the state. It's a small state. It's not very heavily industrialized. Ten. Okay. Um, just on time. So, um, so Delaware uh, exists as a, uh, a, a, a disinterested state, let's put it this way, because it, uh, in, in the population of Delaware, we don't find shareholders, managers, owners, customers, suppliers, creditors of corporations. Uh, they are really outside the eco economic system for all practical purposes. And um, uh, thus, they are not a, a, a company looking for political influence um, it's not going to look to Delaware. Uh, nobody has any presence, much less any political influence there. Uh, that's not to say there aren't some internal forces in Delaware that might have some interest uh, in not entirely efficient law. That might include the Delaware Bar, and dare I say it, it might sometimes include the judiciary, which maybe wants to have more litigation than other people would like them to have. But um, uh, let's take that as a side effect, uh, a small effect. Um, Delaware law, it's fair to say, uh, is market-oriented, uh, and that's in part because it can't be politically oriented. Other states, um, uh, conversely, by, the, by, by virtue of the fact that companies that want market-oriented law have Delaware to go to, companies that do that, that do want market-oriented law, go to Delaware, and they take the political heat off of their, their home jurisdiction for adopting market-oriented law. So, um, so the result is uh, a, a, a growing disparity between uh, the corporate law of Delaware, market-oriented, and the corporate law of other states um, uh, where companies are, inc are incorporating because they are market, because they have some political influence. How do we, what evidence do we have of this? Let me take a sip here first. Well, um, how does this play out in fact? What evidence is there for this interpretation of, of uh, the results of free incorporation? Um, first of all, there's the substantive law. Delaware law is, in fact, at least somewhat more protective of non-controlling shareholders uh, from controlling shareholders and from entrenched managers. Second, um, maybe more telling, Companies uh, in the United States seek charters uh, either from one of two states, either the state where they have their corporate headquarters or Delaware. Nobody else, uh, there's no third state that uh, they're going to. Um, if they were looking for specialized corporate law um, or even the, the best corporate law or better corporate law, more efficient corporate law or whatever, um, uh, they might look to third states. But whatever their home state's corporation law is, they either incorporate in the home state or in Delaware, suggesting if they incorporate in their home state, they aren't very sensitive to the nature of the substantive quality of the corporation law. So what are they, what are they, um, uh, what does their home state have to offer them that no third party state would offer them or no other state would offer them? Local influence. If you're a large firm, uh, uh, you, uh, um, um, uh, are a political political actor, or at least can be a political actor uh, at the state level, and um, uh, and get some advantage from it. The uh, a third state, um, if you if you're an Illinois corporation with your headquarters in Illinois, uh, and you incorporate um, uh, in Ohio, you uh, have lost some of your political influence. You aren't going to have any political influence in Ohio because your plant is in Illinois, your workers are in Illinois, your customers are in Illinois, whatever. Um, and, uh, and you're going to lose your political influence, in, some of your political influence in Illinois because you aren't really an Illinois corporation. Uh, you've declared yourself to be a, a citizen, as it were, a resident of Ohio. So there's a strong incentive if you want to maximize your political clout to incorporate in your home jurisdiction, your, your headquarters state. We see uh, some evidence of that influence. There are some notorious cases. I won't go through them in detail, but uh, we see, for example, the state of Massachusetts at the behest of one company that couldn't get its shareholders to, that faced a hostile takeover, couldn't get its shareholders to, uh, to
to approve a, a classified board that would have stopped the takeover. So it went to the Massachusetts legislature and within days got the Massachusetts legislature to impose a classified board on every Massachusetts company. <laughs> Two weeks later, it sold itself to a French company. Um, uh, the, um, uh, so in, in, in short, large companies in, in, in medium-sized states, or even large states, Massachusetts is a big state, can, um, uh, can induce the, the state legislature to do things often that their own shareholders can't be induced to do. Inf in influence can be very strong. A final and, and interesting bit of evidence in favor of the, the um, regulatory dualism view is that uh, actually it's the smaller states that have the largest rate of in-state incorporation. That is, uh, in small states, a larger percentage of companies headquartered in that state uh, actually incorporate in that state than is the case in big states. Well, small states don't have very well-developed corporate law. Some of them have virtually no precedent on any interesting question. Um, the, uh, why wouldn't you inst incorporate in, in another state, maybe a neighboring state, that has better developed corporate law? Well, if, the, if there are no, there's no precedent, there's very few constraints on local judges, and if a case comes up involving your corporation and you want a favorable judgment, there's a lot of space to move uh, uh, if you're in N North Dakota. So, um, so uh, ha having a state uh, that uh, doesn't have much corporate law at all, good or bad, uh, is a great advantage if you want to maximize your political influence. If uh, we nationalized corporate law uh, at the federal level, um, we would find, we would have a, a body of law, as my colleague Roberto Romano has pointed out long past, um, that would be a compromise. That would reflect, uh, um, sure, to be sure, some pressure for market-oriented law from firms that want market-oriented law, but uh, uh, at the same time would re presumably reflect a great deal of political pressure from various interest groups uh, in the society as a whole, business groups, labor groups, consumer groups, et cetera. Uh, um, institutional shareholders, uh, which might be for the better or for the worse, as Chief Justice Stein has pointed out, et cetera. So we would have a, uh, not, not uh, polar types of law, uh, as in regulatory dualism, but rather a compromise we can't say a priori whether this would be a, a social welfare improvement, having a, a single body of, as it were, compromised law, half compromised law, um, or the opportunity to have a, a, a Delaware out there offering a thoroughly market-oriented system of law. And um, uh, the disputes over the effects of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, which are at corporate law adopted at the federal level, reflect a bit this ambiguity or ambivalence about uh, uh, the, it, the value of federal corporation law. Let me, uh, how much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. Let me just throw this in context. Um, um, we've been focusing on what we've called regulatory dualism. Uh, it's one of only uh, at least four different kinds of, of dynamic we might find in a system of free incorporation. Um, and we list them here. First, there's regulatory diversification uh, uh, in which uh, corporations are heterogeneous in their need for corporation law. They, uh, uh, different states specialize in attracting and serving the interests of different kinds of companies. Uh, the state of Maryland, for example, at one point uh, specialized in offering law for mutual funds, uh, which uh, needs special uh, freedom to issue uh, large numbers of shares quickly and so forth. Um, there is regulatory experimentation. Uh, let us say we see, re we see relatively little regulatory diversification in American corporate law across states. There's regulatory experimentation. Um, corporations may be uh, uh, homogeneous uh, in their needs, but it's unclear what the legal regime is that meets those needs best, so different states can experiment with it, and uh, we find out in the long run which system works best. Then there's regulatory competition, uh, as we've described it before. Here, we, corporations are th assumed to be homogeneous in their needs for corporation law, but we need competition among the offers, uh, the, the, the makers of that law, to um, uh, to, to be induced to adopt it because governments and bureaucrats are slow um, uh, otherwise, without the competition, pressure of competition. And then there's regulatory dualism, which you've already heard enough about. Uh, all four of these uh, dynamics can be operating at the same time, we should point out. And I think it's fair to say in the United States, all four are operating uh, uh, currently. 
our point here is only to, to emphasize that though the first three get some attention in the literature, uh, the fourth, regulatory dualism, has been the subject of really, relatively little uh, concentrated focus. Um, a word about OP. Well, you don't get, uh, Europe has got, uh, is trying to decide what to do about this, whether to adopt free incorporation or not. The European Court of Justice has really thrown them into a system of regulatory competition or of regulatory of free incorporation, I should say. And now they're trying to work out what, uh, what they're going to do with it. Is it going to be regulatory competition or regulatory dualism? There is substantial evidence that uh, uh, they're moving toward a system of regulatory dualism, which allows them to co-opt uh, existing uh, embedded political interests without blocking reform entirely. That's the end. Thank you all very much.